Attack number one, attack number two, attack number three, number four, number five. How many times you wanna attack? How many times you wanna interfere? Just stop. Osiris, the judge of the dead, the judge of the soul. Osiris, a stand for the soul, eternal love and justice and truth. Coming down from the sky, showing you the way, lifting you high. I try to do the right thing You come up, you attack, you in the fear You sabotage, you manipulate the truth Because you're jealous and envious You better stop fighting Osiris and Isis Because you could have never win it You never could have win in the past and the present and the future Cause history is Osiris with Revelation, a tale of the end. Therefore, if you were going to include something like the life of Adam and Eve in the Christian Bible, you would need to include it in the beginning of the text, near Genesis. Since it's clearly a retelling of Genesis, there was no place for it in that canon. But not an exact retelling. Some scholars believe the life of Adam and Eve was written in the first century, as much as a thousand years after the first known written manuscript of Genesis. There is another theory that it was written at a later time, in the 3rd or 4th century, at the time the Christian Bible was taking form. What the reasons for its not attaining that status might be, we don't know. Uh, it could be, uh, this is just guessing, that uh, people knew it was written at a later time. Uh, the teachings of the book, you would think, would be compatible with Jewish and Christian teachings. But we don't have any ancient discussion about why it may have been thought uh, not on the same level with, say, Genesis. While its exclusion may be a mystery, we do know the book was popular in its day. The anonymous writer gave his ancient audience a chance to see these temptations from Eve's point of view. It is a surprising tale of deceit and betrayal far different from the version found in Genesis. In The Life of Adam and Eve, Eve seems to be an innocent victim. 
we find out that Eve was alone. Adam was nowhere near her. They both had separate halves of the garden. We also find out that the guardian angels who are supposed to protect Adam and Eve are gone. So Eve is sitting there alone when all of a sudden she sees not only the serpent, but, an, but the devil disguised as an angel. And this devil as an angel convinces her to take from the tree that she is not supposed to eat from. And at first she says, no, no, I, I really shouldn't do that. It'll make God angry. And he says, after you're done, you won't need to worry about God, in effect. When Satan's ruse is revealed, Eve's innocent trust turns to terror. She realizes that Adam will share her hellish punishment, expulsion from paradise, and a life of wandering in an unforgiving wasteland. Adam and Eve, of course, want to get back into the garden. And so Adam devises a means by which they are tested and they stand in, in rivers, they stand in separate rivers. Do you wish to kill me that I might die? Adam responded, don't say such things, Eve, lest the Lord God bring upon us some other curse. How could it be that I should raise my hand against my own flesh? Adam decides to stand in the River Jordan for 40 days and suggests to Eve that since she's weaker, she should only stand in the Tigris for 34 days. However, while she's in the Tigris, the devil comes disguised as an angel after 18 days and convinces her to leave the river. The Lord God has heard your lamenting and accepted your penitence. Now therefore, come out of the water and I will lead you to the place where your food is prepared. She walks to, over to Adam with this, this wonderful news, we've been rescued from the rivers, and Adam looks at her and sees not an angel standing beside her, but the devil. And he says, Eve, how could you have done this again? When Adam was created in God's image, the angels were ordered to bow to Adam or worship Adam, and the Satan refused to do this. He said he should not bow to someone who was created after he was was inferior to him. In defiance, Satan and his gang of rebel angels build a rival throne that literally places them above God. Outraged, God expels them from heaven and banishes them into the depths of the earth. This tale of Satan's jealousy and revenge is not found in the Holy Bible, yet it is among the stories told in the Quran, sacred scripture for Muslims, written 800 years later. The Quran tells us that God creates human beings, Adam, out of clay, and that God creates these mysterious beings, jinn, out of what the Quran says is smokeless fire, fire without smoke. God calls Adam the greatest of his God's creations and tells the angels to bow down before this creation. And one of them refuses in the text of the Quran Satan, Iblis, refuses to bow down. We're not sure what manner of being Satan is. So there's contention there among Muslims. You know, is this an angel that disobeys? Because how can the angels disobey God? For Christians and Jews, the creation story in Genesis leaves a lingering question. If Adam and Eve had two sons and no daughters, if no other humans existed, who gave birth to humanity? When we return, an obscure Hebrew text with a troubling answer. We now return to Banned from the Bible. One of the Holy Bible's more puzzling omissions is found in the book of Genesis, in the story of Adam and Eve's son, Cain. He murders his brother, Abel, is cursed by God, and becomes a fugitive. Then, suddenly, we learn that Cain has a wife who is pregnant. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Anyone who's ever taught Sunday school is familiar with the problem that you talk about Cain getting married and suddenly a million hands go up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, where did the wife come from? We know about Adam and Eve, of course, but what about their children? 
their sons, who were the wives of the first males. I think that the Bible story is disturbing on many levels, but some people find it most disturbing in the way that it doesn't make literal sense that Cain obviously can't marry somebody who doesn't exist and they can't get to the deeper levels until they find some kind of peace with the narrative level with the story of what happened and so for many until we can figure out who Cain's wife was we can't discuss the deeper issues some 150 years before the birth of Jesus an unknown author sought to clarify the telling of creation as written in the book of Genesis it was a time in history when many Jews were being tempted by other faiths. The author wanted to maintain the purity of their beliefs to ensure strict observance of all Jewish law. His book, called Jubilees, offers intimate details of the lives and struggles of the first human beings. It begins with Moses. He is visited by an angel who reveals a secret behind the scenes version of Jewish history from the very beginning of creation to the parting of the Red Sea. I would suggest that the Book of Jubilees is what we would today call a fundamentalist book. Why? The Book of Jubilees tries to answer unanswered questions, to cross every T and dot every I of the stories in Genesis. They bleep over the parts that they don't think are particularly important, and they dwell on the issues that they want answered. He wants to take it too literally and therefore gets boxed into a corner of having to explain every detail. And it comes out creating more problems than it actually solves. Among the more disturbing revelations offered in Jubilees is a rather chilling answer to the mysterious and sudden appearance of a wife for Cain. Jubilees tells us that Adam and Eve have nine sons and daughters, not just the three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth, mentioned in Genesis. Jubilees also tells of Cain's younger sister, Awan, who becomes his wife. And Cain took Awan his sister to be his wife, and she bare him Enoch at the close of the fourth Jubilee. There is in the Bible a fairly powerful prohibition against incest, and clearly the idea that Cain married his sister would be very difficult for people, and it just shows how hard it was for people to accept that a new woman would come out of nowhere. It's interesting to have folks in the 21st century reading Jubilees. The same people who like reality TV, the same people who will go to a movie such as Aliens, who seem to really sort of enjoy gore, violence, sex. Those sorts of folks just would seem to love Jubilees. If the Bible is read as literal history, a story of the first humans that included incest would have been taboo and thus not acceptable for inclusion in the Holy Bible. Even so, why would this ancient author solve the problem of Cain's wife by having him marry his own sister?